Hi, and uh, welcome to this next video on linear regression. So just to recap, in the previous video, we motivated linear regression. And then we, at the end of the day, we ended up with this formulation that we want to minimize the loss of a given hypothesis W. So w specifies a hyperplane, where the loss is, I guess, this least squared loss. So you sum over all the training examples. You look at the prediction that you would make on this example, given the vector W, and the prediction you would make is the inner product between W and the feature vector XI. You subtract off the true label YI, and then you square it, right? So this is the least squared loss, uh, ignoring the normalization term one over N in front. Okay, so we want to minimize this. And then we looked at perhaps a more convenient way to write it is that if we looked at the data matrix X with having the feature vectors as rows and the uh, vector Y of all the labels and the vector W with all the, the parameters, then the loss could also be written as uh, this inner product between X, W minus Y uh, and itself. So this is where we ended up in the previous video. So now we would like to, to show how you can actually minimize this expression. <clears throat> okay, so to minimize this expression, we start by observing, right, that L really is a function from D variables to uh, a single number, right? So there are D parameters in W, and there's a single output value. So it's a function from RD to R. Okay, so the question is really, how can we minimize such functions? And uh, just to start out easily, let's look at what if we had a function from just one variable to one variable, or to one value, right? So if, if F, L is a function of one variable from R to R, then at least if L is a differentiable function, then perhaps the picture could look something like this, and we're looking for the minimum. Now, the property that the minimum has, if you remember from our basic calculus, is that the, the gradient evaluated at this x, uh, x being the minimum, has to be equal to zero. Right. Of course, the gradient can also be uh, zero in other places at local maxima and at saddle points. But in concretely, it definitely has to be zero at the minimum. Okay, so we will try to use this as a as a guide towards finding a way to minimizing this general uh, function from d variables to to a single value. Okay, so if you have functions of multiple variables, so say x one to x d, so it's a function from r d to r, and if this function is differentiable, then you can also minimize it uh, as follows. So when you have multiple variables, you can introduce the notion of the gradient or the gradient vector. So the gradient is similar to the derivative. If you have a single variable, it's just a vector this time. And uh, so the gradient vector here is really a vector that has one entry for each of the D variables that goes into this function. Okay, And each of these entries just contain the partial derivatives of this uh, function L with respect to each of the D variables, right? So it's the partial derivative with respect to X1 up to the partial derivative of L of X with respect to XD. Okay, so X here really represents a whole uh, vector with all the elements X1 up to XD. <clears throat> so the generalization of this property of local minima uh, of a single variable to, to multiple variables is just that this gradient vector actually also has to be zero at a local minimum. Okay, so, so this whole vector with all these partial derivatives has to, uh, has to be zero at this point in, in order for there to be a minimum. Okay, so we can use this as a guiding principle in how to find or to minimize such a function of multiple variables. Okay. So let's just, I think it would be good with an example here. So let's say I have a function here of two variables. I have two variables, x1 and x2, and the function is 2x squared plus x1. Okay, so let's say I wanted to look at what is the gradient of this function. Then the gradient, again, is a vector and has two uh, entries. The first entry being the partial derivative of f with respect to x1, and the second being the partial derivative of f with respect to x2. So if we look at this function f and look at the partial derivative with respect to x1, see the first term here is just a constant factor. We're doing partial derivative with respect to x1, so this disappears. And the second term here, x1, the partial derivative of that is just 1. It's the, the leading constant on, in front of x1. So you get just one here. And on the other hand, if you're looking at the partial derivative with respect to x2, then the second term here is just a constant. And so it goes away. And the first term here uh, then become 4x2, right? Because the partial derivative of x2 squared is just 2x2. And we also have the front constant 2 in front. So this here is then the gradient of this function. <clears throat> Good. So. Uh, for linear regression, right, we have this function from d variables uh, that we have over here, right? So this is the, the loss function. This is this giant sum. And the, 
the variables that occur here are really the, the parameters in W, right? Those are the ones we're trying to minimize. All the X i's and Y i's are the training data that's given to us, right? These are not something that we can change. What we can change are the D parameters of the hyperplane W. So these are the ones uh, that we think of L as a function of, of W. Now, the general strategy that we'll try to follow is that we'll compute this, uh, an expression for the gradient, set it to zero. And this will, uh, the idea is that this will give us uh, the minimum of this function. Now, of course, this does not in general give us a minimum of a function because it could also give a maximum or saddle point that there could be multiple local minima, but not the global minima. But what we'll see uh, later on is that uh, this concrete function L up here is a convex function of W, which means that a local minima is actually a global minima. And moreover, there will be no local maxima and no saddle points. So actually, if we compute the gradient and set it to zero, we'll actually end up with unique uh, minimum for this function. Okay, so this is only because this concrete loss function L is a convex function of W. And we'll return to what that means in, in later lectures. But for now, we'll just trust that this is a good strategy that will compute the gradient and set it to zero. Okay, so we wanna compute this, this gradient, right? So the gradient again, recall is the, is the vector with all the partial derivatives as entries, right? So it has D entries, each of them being the partial derivative of this loss function uh, with respect to w1 up to wd and want to take this vector and set it to zero. So, you know, to do this, I guess we have to be able to set every single entry of this one to zero. So let's compute an expression for the jth entry of this gradient vector. Right, so that's the, the natural step to take. So let's look at the jth entry of the gradient. So the great jth entry is against the partial derivative of this loss function with respect to wj. And the loss function is this uh, least squared loss, right? You sum over all the points and then take the square difference between the inner product between xi and w and yi. Okay, so let's compute the partial derivative with respect to wj. So first of all, the first observation is that if I take a derivative of a sum, it's just the sum of the derivative. So we can move uh, the derivative into the sum. So I just need to be able to compute the partial derivative with respect to wj for each of these individual terms in the sum. And here we're going to use the chain rule, right? Because this is a, really a composite function with the outer function being the square and the inner function being xi transpose w minus yi. <clears throat> so this rule says, the chain rule basically says that if I want to take the derivative of a composite function, if h is f of g of x, then the derivative of h is the derivative of f applied to g of x times the derivative of g of x. So if we do this here, right? So we need to, so the outer function again is the square function. The derivative is two times x if it's x squared. So if you do this to this outer function here, right, we get two, and then we have to still uh, plug in the inner function inside, as you see here on the chain rule. So the inner function is just xi transpose w minus yi, and the square goes away and we get a factor two in front. And then we have to multiply it again with the partial derivative of uh, the inner function. So we still have to compute the partial derivative of this inner function with respect to wj. Okay, so if we expand it out, this inner product, right? This is just a sum over all the coordinates of W times this, the corresponding coordinates of Xi. So if I take the derivative with respect to Wj, right? We notice that in this sum, right? There's only one term, right? The Jth term has Wj times Xij. So uh, that term, it's just Wj times Xij. The derivative with respect to Wj is just Xij. Right. And all the remaining terms, it's a wi different from wj, so they just become zero when we take derivatives. And the yi is just a constant again, uh, so that also goes away. So really, the only thing that we're left with is the coefficient onto wj, which is xij. So this is really the jth entry of this gradient vector. So really, if we now we computed what is the, an expression for the jth entry, and so if we just stack those for all the j entries of the, of the gradient, the gradient is going to look like this. Like in the first entry, it's going to have the sum from one to n of twice this uh, inner product between xi and w minus yi times um, xi one, right? So you have the, uh, so you're, you're summing over all the i's in the uh, first column of x. Okay, let's try to see if we can simplify this expression a little bit. Still a little bit complicated, so, so let's try to, to deal with it. So what we did now is here, I just split the, the sum on the minus part. So basically I just, I move the two outside. I take the part that does not involve yi, 
So I just multiply xi1 into uh, this uh, expression here. So I get xi transpose w xi1 all the way down to uh, xi transpose w xid here at the bottom. And then again, I also have the, the terms with the yi's. And over here, right, I just have the sum from i equals one to n, yi xi1, all the way down to the sum from i equals one to n, yi xid. Okay, so now I just move that expression up. So let's try to work a bit more with this one and, and let's have a look at the, the last term here. So what's happening in this uh, last expression here? So I claim that this whole expression here is just x transpose y. So let's try to see why that's the case. So let's try to look at the first entry here, what's happening here. All right, so if I sum from one to n, and then I take yi, so then I, and then I multiply it with xi1, this is really just the inner product between the first column of x, right? So this is when I'm summing over i, I'm summing down the rows of this matrix. I'm taking the inner product between the first column of x with the y vector. Right? To get the inner product between the first column of x with the y vector, into the first entry of a vector, I can take x transpose y, right? Because then the first column of x becomes the first row of x transpose. And then the first entry of this product is just the inner product between the first row of x transpose with y, which is the inner product between the first column of x and y. And in general, right, if I go down to the jth entry, the value that is stored here is really just the inner product between y and the jth column of x, which is precisely what I get if I take x transpose and multiply it with y. So this is just a simplification of this latter term. So I just moved it up. So now we simplify this expression. So now let's try to deal with the, the first expression here. So the first step is to just try and simplify uh, this term in here, right? So in here, we have the inner product between uh, xi and w. Now the inner product between xi and w, that's also just the same as the ith entry of x times w, right? Because that gives the, the ith row of x is xi. And so this product here has its ith entry equal the inner product between the ith row of x and w, meaning xi and w. So this is just uh, taking these two terms and writing it as uh, the product of x and w, taking the ith coordinate of that product. Okay, so I just moved it up. So now let's try to simplify it a little bit again. So what we have here, if we look at any of these entries again, maybe let's look at the first one first. So again, we're summing from one to n, right? So we're taking each of the coordinates of x, w, and then we're multiplying it with each of the coordinates of the first column of x. Right. In general, if we go to the jth row, then we're taking the inner product between xw and the jth column of x. So what we can do now is that we just, so if we want the inner product between the jth column of x and xw, this is exactly the same as taking x transpose multiplied with xw. And this is what we did, the same trick as we did over here. So this whole expression here is just two, it's just x transpose x times w. Okay. So now we have an expression here for the gradient <clears throat> that is a little bit simpler than what we started out with. So it's just twice x transpose xw minus x transpose y. Okay. And now we're in a position where we can try and set this to zero. Now, so this is what's our strategy, right? If we could set this to zero, then we would uh, arrive at, an, at a uh, global minimum because this loss function is a convex function, which we haven't proved but, and we haven't defined it, but we will just uh, trust that this is the case for now. Okay, so I want to set this expression to zero, right? So the first thing I could do is, of course, to move the x transpose y to the other side and get rid of the factor two. So this is zero if and only if x transpose xw is equal to x transpose y. Now, the next step I could do, right, I want to figure out what I should set w to, right? w is my uh, hypothesis that I want to choose in order to minimize this function here. So I want to I want to isolate w in this, uh, in this equality. So what I'd like to do is just to multiply with the inverse of x transpose x on both sides, right? So let's pretend for now that x transpose x is in fact invertible. So if it was invertible, then we just multiply on both sides with x transpose x inverse. So it goes away over here. And then we have x transpose x inverse times x transpose y on the other side. And this here is the w uh, that sets the gradient to zero, meaning that it also minimizes this loss function. Okay. And this concrete matrix here is, is often referred to as the pseudo inverse of X, uh, this matrix here that, that basically solves this least squared regression problem. So X transpose X inverse times X transpose is 
what we call the pseudo inverse of x. Okay. And the nice thing about it is that here's the, there's just a unique formula for finding w here if x is uh, transpose x is invertible, right? You just have to compute this expression, take y, multiply with this concrete matrix, you're going to get a unique w, and that's the uh, optimal solution. Right? So this is a very simple way of actually finding the best w is just uh, computing this expression directly. Okay, so if x transpose x is invertible, then we can minimize the loss by setting w to this expression. And so that, that's, that's basically it. The algorithm for solving least squared uh, linear regression is just compute and return this uh, vector w as your hypothesis, x transpose x inverse times x transpose y. Very simple algorithm. And we can also look at this running time because well, what do we have to do? We have to compute x transpose x. So again, x is a, an n by d matrix. So this here is a d by n times an n by d matrix. The product can be computed in d squared n in uh, time. Okay, then you have to compute the inverse of x transpose x. So the inverse, it's the inverse of a d by d matrix. This can be done in d cubed time. And finally, we have to, well, we also have to multiply uh, x transpose with y. y is a length n vector. This is a d by n, n matrix that takes d n time. Finally, uh, we have to compute the product of the thing that we did over here with x transpose y. And uh, this is just d squared time because this is a d long vector and this is a d by d matrix. So this is d squared time. And total, depending on uh, d and n, right, the, the running time becomes d squared n plus d cubed, where typically the d squared n term is the one that, that dominates the expression. Okay, so that's an algorithm. It's very simple. You just compute this uh, closed form expression and that gives you the W. Okay, now, uh, of course, we assumed here that this x transpose x is invertible. Of course, it could be the case that it's not invertible, and uh, it's actually not so hard to deal with this case. For here, I'll just give the basic idea, and the basic idea is that if you, you can just delete some of the columns of x, which are linearly dependent on some of the other ones. Okay, you can prove that if you just delete some that are linearly dependent of others, you don't change the uh, value of the optimal solution. And there's still an optimal solution that does as well as before. So you can just keep deleting columns, features that are linearly dependent on the others uh, until you have an, an invertible matrix. That's the basic idea. Okay. So maybe let's just conclude by saying, okay, so we, we did all these calculation steps to, to compute this gradient, right? So, and we ended up with this rather simple expression, but the, the steps along the way were a bit tedious. Uh, so just here for the end of this, this video, we'll try to just introduce a more direct way of computing this gradient. Uh, and also it will be convenient later on in the course. Okay, so let's just finish up with a slightly more elegant proof if you are willing to uh, take a few things for granted. Okay, so uh, what we'll introduce now is the matrix of derivatives, uh, which is also more popularly known as the Jacobian. So in general, let's say if I have a function of multiple variables to multiple outputs. So let's say L is a function that has K outputs, and it's a function of D input variables. So it's a function from RD to RK. And let's assume that each of these individual functions that give each of the outputs is itself a differentiable function. Then we can define the matrix of derivatives, which is also known in the literature as the Jacobian. And it's a K by D matrix. So what is the, the entries of it? So the Jacobian has uh, K rows, one for each of the output functions. And in one of these rows, uh, each of the columns gives the partial derivative of this output with respect to each of the input variables, right? So they have a, each of the columns give partial derivatives with respect to a concrete input variable. Each of the rows looks at a concrete of the output functions. Okay, so this is the matrix of derivatives. It's just the definition. And uh, the gradient vector that we looked at before is just the transpose of the matrix of derivatives, right? So recall again, right? So what we looked at before is if you had just a single output. Okay, so the Jacobian, if you have a single output, right, would be, would only have one row and then would have all the partial derivatives as columns. The gradient that we defined before was, was a column vector with an entry for each of the partial derivatives. And so basically this uh, gradient we had before is just the transpose of this uh, Jacobian or matrix of derivatives as we'll call it for simplicity. Okay, so 
Okay, so so the gradient vector is just a special case of the matrix derivatives, and then we can try to use general rules for these uh, matrices to uh, to compute the gradient that we did before. Okay, so let me just give an example of what this matrix of derivatives would look like. So let's say here I have a function L. It, it's a function of two variables, x1 and x2, and it produces three outputs. Uh, the first output being x1 plus x2 squared, the second output being x1 squared, and the last output being x1, x2. So this here is a function from R2, takes two inputs, and then two R3, so it produces three outputs. Okay, so then the matrix of derivatives, right, uh, if you remember the, the formula here, right, has a row for each of the outputs. So up here, right, there are three outputs, so it's going to have three rows, and it has a column for each of the input variables. So if we look at this example right here, uh, the first column, we only take partial derivatives with respect to x1. The first entry here is uh, the first output. So we take the, the partial derivative of this expression here with respect to x1, that gives a one. The second entry here is the partial derivative of the second output with respect to x1. So x1 squared, if we take partial derivative with respect to x1, we get two x1. Finally here, if we take partial derivative of x1, x2 with respect to x1, we get x2. Similarly over here, right, if we look at, uh, so now we're doing partial derivative with respect to x2. In the first row here, we're doing it for the first output function. So the partial derivative with respect to x2 of this expression here is just 2x2. The partial derivative with respect to x2 of x1 squared is zero. And finally down here, right, the partial derivative of x1, x2 with respect to x2 is just x1. Okay, so this is the matrix of derivatives of the Jacobian for this function here. Okay. So this is the matrix of derivatives. And uh, they're actually very convenient rules for computing these matrices of derivatives. Okay, so if I have a general expression, right, ax plus b, then I could also uh, look at where well, x is the is the variables, right? So this is a function uh, from the variables in x to uh, a number of outputs being equal to the number of rows of a. And I can look at what is the matrix of derivatives here for such an expression. The matrix derivative for ax plus b is just going to be a. And here in record, the variables are the ones in x. Right, so, so basically you want to think of this as, as the following, right? So uh, this is basically an equivalent of this, the standard rule. If I have an expression that's called ax plus b, and I take the derivative with respect to x, I just get a, right? So this is basically the same here. Now it's just a matrix and we have multiple outputs and multiple inputs. It's a very nice uh, convenient rule. And maybe let's just, just to figure out what's going on here, right? So, so let's say this matrix A that occurs in this expression is a K by D matrix, right? Then X is a D by one uh, column vector. And B then for everything to match has to be a K by one column vector as well, right? For this whole expression to even make sense, right? So if we think about it, right? So this has K outputs, this expression here, it has D inputs. So the matrix of derivatives, at least according to this definition, has to be a K by D matrix, right? So the function AX, the function of X that evaluates to AX plus B is a function from RD to RK. So the matrix of derivatives should be a K by D matrix. That is at least what we claim here, right? We actually say that the matrix of derivatives is A, which is a K by D matrix. So at least the shapes, the shapes match. This is of course not a proof that this is a correct rule, but at least it's an indication that it's not uh, completely off. But this is a rule and we'll just take it for granted here that you can, that this behaves exactly the same way as if you uh, take derivatives with respect to uh, X in an expression AX plus B, you just get A. This is basically the same. Okay, here's another convenient rule that also looks exactly like something we've seen before. So if I have a function of uh, a vector X that returns X transpose X, then uh, the claim is that the matrix of derivatives is just two X transpose. Okay, so basically this is going to be the equivalent of saying, uh, if I have the expression X squared, which is basically what X transpose X is, and the derivative of this is two X. This is basically what this rule should be thought of, just generalized to functions of multiple variables. So again here, right, X is a column vector, it's a D uh, by one column vector. And so, and this expression, uh, X transpose X is then a function from D variables to a single uh, output element. So what we have here is that uh, the matrix of derivatives, well, there's a single output, so it should just have a single row and the D variables, which should have D columns. So the matrix of derivatives should be a one by D 
uh, matrix. And what you see here is that X transpose is one by D and then you scale by two. So at least the shapes again match, so which is an indication that this rule is, is sound at least. Okay, so we'll just take these two rules for granted. So if I have an expression AX plus B, um, then the matrix of derivatives when X are my variables is just A. And if I have an expression X transpose X, uh, then the matrix of derivatives is just two X transpose. Okay, so with these rules established over here, let's uh, find a quicker way or maybe a more direct way of computing uh, the gradient of, uh, of this loss function here. And recall again, right, that the gradient, this vector is just the transpose of the matrix of derivatives. Okay, so what we could do is just compute this matrix of derivatives, or also known as the Jacobian. So let's try to compute the matrix of derivatives for this expression here in the middle, right? This is a simpler expression. Okay. So the matrix of derivatives and W is our parameters. So what can we do here? And if we look at this expression here, right, we see that it's a composite function again, right, where the outer function is really X transpose X and the inner function is X W minus Y. All right, so the outer function is on the form of the second rule and the inner function is on the form of the first rule. And actually this chain rule applies directly to matrices of derivatives. So you can just use the chain rule again meaning that we have to take the, uh, the derivative of the outer function being x transpose x. Then we have to plug in to this derivative the inner function, and then we have to multiply with the derivative of the inner function, or the matrix of derivatives for the inner function. So let's try to do that. So we first rule on the, the outer function, right? It's an x transpose x, so the matrix of the derivative should be 2x transpose. And then in place of x, we should put the inner function here. So this is what we do, right? We take 2, and then we take the inner function and it has to be transposed as we see here on the rule. So we get two times X W minus Y transpose. And then we still have to multiply with the matrix of derivatives of the inner function. So we still have to compute this matrix of derivatives for the inner function here. Now this is convenient again, right? Because now this has the exact form of the second rule here. Uh, so this should just give the matrix X, right? So, so this is all we get. 2x uh, times xw minus y transpose times x. I just, on this expression, I just multiply x in. And um, so basically, if I, if I multiply x in and, and handle the transpose as well, then, so basically I have to do the transpose. So I get w transpose, x transpose multiplied with uh, x. And I have to transpose y as well. So that gives me a y transpose x. I have a two in front. So this is the matrix of derivatives for this whole expression. Okay, so and now we just have to do the last step, recalling that the matrix of derivatives is the transpose of the gradient. So if we want to get the gradient, we should just transpose this expression. And okay, if we move the transpose in, uh, now we're going to get an X transpose, then we're going to get an X, we're going to get an W, and we're going to get an X transpose and a Y. So we just get this expression, okay. And this is exactly the same expression as we got before. So if you're willing to trust these rules for matrices of derivatives with, and together with the chain rule in this case, then at least these, these steps are a little simpler and, and more direct than having to sit and stare and all these uh, long uh, sums that we had before and, and figure out that some of these expressions correspond to uh, inner products between some of the columns of X with some of the, uh, with XW and so on, right? So this, this is definitely a more direct approach if you if you believe these rules okay so so that's the end of it so in least squared uh, in linear regression basically what we're minimizing is this loss that is the sum of all the points of the difference between the prediction x i's in the product of w and the label y i squared and uh, if we define the data matrix x as having these rows with all the feature vectors the vector y having all the the labels as, as uh, columns as entries of a column vector and W being the parameters of the of the model, then the simple solution is just you should just you have this analytic solution that's a closed form expression for W where you just have to choose it as uh, x x transpose x inverse if it exists times x transpose y, and if x transpose x is not invertible, you can you can deal with it by just deleting columns of x that are linearly dependent on other columns of x. Okay, so that's basically it. Um, and this is, I guess, how you solve uh, linear regression.